Good evening and thank you for being here. My name is Thane McCullough, I'm president here at Gonzaga, and it is a real privilege to both be with you and to have an opportunity to be just a small part of um, this long-awaited and really significant event. So um, I want, first of all, to thank uh, Mike Herzog uh, and Gene for allowing us to play host uh, to be actually the first to host uh, an event around the long-awaited completion of a new book. <laughs> well, kind of a new book, <laughs> right? Um, and we also really want to take an opportunity to uh, thank Andreas John and Michael Kep, uh, without whom uh, this work would not be brought to the forefront as it is. They are with Will Dreamly Arts Publishing, and they too have played a really significant role in allowing Gonzaga to host the launch uh, of this uh, publication. Um, all of us here, uh, I believe, uh, and many more uh, are privileged to know Mike Herzog, and uh, it is certainly the case that uh, while he's now been uh, in semi-retirement from his work at Gonzaga and full-time uh, writing, uh, that he uh, is considered by so many an esteemed uh, and beloved member of our university community. Um, he is now Professor Emeritus uh, of English and spent over three decades teaching the works of Chaucer as well as many other uh, great uh, writers, and uh, prior to 2007, although I myself had been part of our university for a long time by then and working here, um, it was uh, when I was rather unexpectedly appointed to the role of interim academic vice president uh, that I first had the opportunity to meet Mike Herzog. Now, I knew of him by reputation, uh, and and uh, I think the same went for him, but we really didn't know one another. Uh, and as fate would have it, and really fortune as well, over the succeeding eight or nine years, and across many different conversations and projects and initiatives and milestone events, I came to really come ever more deeply to appreciate the intellect and the care and the love for learning that is at the core of Mike's being. So um, it is perhaps to some degree uh, Chaucer that we owe a debt of gratitude uh, for Mike's optimism and his patience uh, and his love for teaching and learning. Uh, but we are in turn very grateful to you, Mike and for all of your contributions and your dedication uh, and commitment to the idea of uh, bringing once again uh, to the fore and to life uh, stories that were first told now 600 years ago and filling in some gaps as well. Um, tonight, I'm really privileged to hand the mic first to um, a great colleague of ours uh, who will do uh, an introduction of her own. Uh, Dr. Jessica Mazzioni is the Powers Chair in Humanities and Professor in the Departments of English, Women's and Gender Studies, and Native American Studies. And perhaps most important of all, shares together with myself the distinction of one other thing in common with Mike Herzog, and that is we're all alums. So uh, with no further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Jessica Mazzioni. Thank you. If anyone would have told my 20-year-old self that I would be here tonight in this capacity, she would have not believed you. Um, I'm so honored to be here. I want to start with a personal note about Mike Herzog as a teacher, as a colleague, a friend, and as a mentor. 
although I was not lucky enough to be one of the Chaucer students invited into Mike and Jean's home for one of their famous medieval feasts, still one of my most distinct college memories is writing, directing, and acting in a morality play <laughs> with my peers 25 years ago in Mike Herzog's medieval drama course. 10 years later, I returned to Gonzaga University as a professor in the English department. And Mike, no longer Dr. Herzog to me, which took some getting used to on my part, was by far the most welcoming and helpful colleague and mentor. He did for me what the best mentors do. I didn't know he was mentoring me. <laughs> he was consistently and genuinely curious about what I was experiencing and as as an incoming faculty member. And he also pulled the curtains back on much of the inner workings of the university so that I could see for myself how I might participate in and contribute to its evolution. As just one example, during his time as chief of staff, Mike created a student advisory board to the president. Because of Mike's guidance, I was able to smoothly transition into the faculty advisory role for this group upon Mike's retirement. And each semester, I get to participate and bear witness to invested students engaging Thane on all matters of student experience at GU. For that and so much more, I want to publicly say thank you to Mike and to pledge that I will do my best to serve junior faculty and all potential mentees with as much grace. And now, I am not a Chaucer scholar here to tell you about the brilliance of Michael B. Herzog's pilgrimage, the only complete version of Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales vis-a-vis -vis Chaucer's brilliance. My expertise, instead, is contemporary literature. And this book is a 21st century text that brings with it and ultimately updates and completes stories that have been celebrated over 600 years of human history. This is a vital contribution to culture and literature in English, not only because it grants access to Chaucer's world and achievements, because, but because it reveals and highlights so much about our contemporary world, including how it relates to and departs from the world Chaucer inhabited in the 1300s. In his best-selling book, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, Yuval Noah Harari maintains that the ability to craft stories set Homo sapiens apart, not only as the sole surviving human species, apparently there were about 12 human species at one time, but as the Earth's dominant species. Shared stories, he goes on to explain, are what allow humans to collaborate in large numbers and across vast distances. Stories, furthermore, explain why we haven't evolved much physically as a species over the millennia. Since we change our stories swiftly and skillfully, there's not so much need for other adaptations. As circumstances shift, we acclimate by revisiting and revising the stories that provide the structure and meaning of our daily lives. We are all on a pilgrimage through time. Some among us, like teacher, scholar, and author, Mike Herzog, will serve as wayfinders. Much like Herzog's 2019 book, This Passing World, in which readers gain access to the journal of Chaucer's last 30 months of life in his own hand, <laughs> Pilgrimage, the only complete version of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, gives readers the opportunity to not only connect with our 14th century human ancestors and their grapplings with the psychosociology of human desires, behaviors, and prospects, but also the text invites us to explore anew the power of storytelling itself, a power Harari credits for human survival and dominance in history, and a power we must call upon to create our collective future. As the completed version of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Pilgrimage is a multivocal frame story so that each story and storyteller, often explicitly, relates to the story that came before and anticipates the next story and teller as well. 
all are framed by the host, the context of the pilgrimage to Canterbury, and Thomas of Becket's shrine housed there, and Herzog's framed narrative of the 2015 archaeological discovery of Chaucer's journal, and this completed version of Canterbury Tales, thought to be left perhaps only three quarters of the way finished at Chaucer's death in 1400. As a collection of raucous yet endearing storytellers and stories about all matters of the human heart and mind, and above all, the art of storytelling itself, Pilgrimage eschews politeness to ultimately unearth all that comprises humanity. In the book, readers encounter all of the things we must learn and relearn as individuals and as members of society about freedom and imprisonment, truth and falsehood, faith and betrayal, poverty and wealth, youth and old age, innocence and experience, reality and appearance, vengeance and forgiveness, acceptance and exclusion, love and hate, gain and loss, hospitality and hostility, change and stagnance, concealment and revelation, time and place, good and evil, not as simple binaries, but complex continua about which we constantly revise our understanding from story to story in the cycle of the book and across the shifting texts and contexts of our own lives. Readers discover how far we've come, or if we've gained any ground at all, <laughs> in our ongoing debates about the sociopolitics of gender, morality, religion, disparity, and education, to name just a few of the topics addressed by Pilgrimage's 30 lively storytellers. What each story reveals about the nature of story emerges again and again as the most significant lesson. Let me share a favorite moment as an example. In The Wife of Bath's Tale, the storyteller, Allison, declares, you tell me whether the painting of a man killing a lion was painted by the lion. As God is my witness, if the stories put out by clerics in their chapels had been written by women, there would be more stories about the wickedness of men than all of Adam's heirs could atone for. While Canterbury Tales reads, more wickedness than baptism could wash away, here Herzog's pilgrimage updates the tale with the notion of atonement, a, wor a word rich with secular as well as religious meaning and which suggests the possibility of a hard-won peace, a hard-won at-one-ment through reparation, even when the situation is beyond the parameters of forgiveness. Herzog's 21st century pilgrimage thus invites us to reflect on how far we have or have not come in our efforts toward gender equity as the world continues to suffer the violence of patriarchy. At the same time, the tale calls attention to itself as narrative about women's desire for sovereignty in direct relationship to the sociopolitics of authorship and publication. The question again comes down to this, whose stories get featured, get attended to, and to what end? What is the relationship between enfranchisement, disenfranchisement, and narrative? I agree with Harari's claim from his perspective as a historian, that stories are what lend humans our humanity. And not only because it suggests I might have some job security as an English professor in this ever-changing world. <laughs> All of my favorite writers and texts put forward this claim as well, implicitly or explicitly, such that as we are entertained by plot and character developments, we also come to know ourselves as once and always storied creatures and creatures who may forge new pathways forward for ourselves and other human beings through the act of storytelling and listening. As a student of literature a quarter of a century ago, I truly enjoyed Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. But as a person trying to find my way in the 21st century, I love Herzog's pilgrimage all the more. Our own human successors will do well to be reading and rereading Michael B. Herzog's Pilgrimage, the only complete version of Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, 600 years 
from now. Now? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, first of all, Thane, thank you for that very kind and generous introduction. You also managed to thank a number of people I have to thank, so thank you for that. And Jessica, thank you for that amazing, lovely, smart set of words that really leaves me with nothing to say. So <laughs> we're done. Okay, I do want to thank uh, a few other people, uh, Andreas John and, and Michael Kep, Kyler, who is helping Andreas tonight, um, and Michael, who not only proofread this book, but also designed the cover. So nice work. You can sort of see it down there. <coughs> um, I also want to thank the GU team that put all this on, that made all this possible, because they've been amazingly generous and kind and, and just put out a lot of effort. Mary Joan Hahn and Angela Ruff. And uh, in, in uh, the alumni office, I believe uh, Cara Hertz and Julie Burdall in the president's office and anybody else that I don't know about, including the people at Hemmingson and Sodexo, every, all of you who have helped put this together. And of course, last and definitely not least, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight because I know that you could be other places. So thank you very much for, for being here. I delivered the manuscript of this book to the, my publisher almost two years ago. But then there was this, this little pandemic that you may have heard about. And then there was a paper shortage. And so there are no papers being, books being printed. But finally, here we are tonight, almost two years later. I'm very happy about that. I want to begin with a very brief history lesson. So if you look at this slide up here, this is a very truncated version of the family tree of the English royalty in the 14th century, part of the English 14th century. When Chaucer was born in 1340, King Edward III and Queen Philippa at the top there were the rulers. They had a bunch of children. I've only put the ones that are relevant up here. Their firstborn son on the extreme left, Edward, later known as the Black Prince, was supposed to become Edward IV. But as you can see, he died a year too early for that to happen. Then his firstborn son, Edward, was supposed to be king, but he had died six years before that. So Richard, his second-born son, became Richard II. While, oh, at the ripe old age of 10. So his uh, guardian and real power behind the throne for a while was his uncle, John of Gaunt, kind of in the middle of that slide. Uh, John of Gaunt was married three times. I've only put two of his wives up here because the other, the other one he had no children with, so not relevant for what I, the point I want to make. His first wife was Blanche of Lancaster, and she bore him seven children, including Henry Bolingbroke, who becomes Henry IV when he usurps the crown from his cousin, Richard II. Uh, Blanche dies of the plague at 26 after seven children as well. John's second wife for 23 years is a woman named Constance of Castile. Uh, they have no children. But two years after she dies, John marries his mistress of some 30 years, Catherine Swinford. And Catherine and he have a number of other children, but they're not listed up either. But um, the point here is that John and his wives are the ancestors of every ruler of England and Scotland since the year 1400. So a fairly significant historical figure. The reason I mentioned him, however, is because of his wife's sister, Philippa, on the extreme right here. Because Philippa marries the son of a London wine merchant who got a job in the royal bureaucracy and gained some fame as a poet, named Geoffrey Chaucer. So, Chaucer is the unlikely brother-in-law of John of Gaunt. That's pretty amazing when you consider the stratification of medieval society in general. And I mention this only because it's not relevant to the book, but I think it's fascinating about 
Chaucer's life, which is fascinating. And if you want to know more about that, you can read buy my other book, which my publisher is very happy to have here <laughs> as well tonight. It's a, this passing world. Okay. But we're here to launch this one. So it has this rather cumbersome title because that's exactly what it is. And let me explain that. In the prologue to his Canterbury Tales, Chaucer actually suggests three different plans for this collection of stories. In the most ambitious version, each pilgrim is to tell two stories on the way to Canterbury and two stories on the way back to London. In the second version, each pilgrim is to tell two stories, but only on the way to London. And in the third one, each pilgrim is to tell one story on the way to Canterbury. And the stories are to be told in what is clearly the first slam poetry contest they know of, <laughs> organized by Harry Bailey apparently a real innkeeper at the time of the Tabard Inn just south of the River Thames, south of London. So Harry persuades the pilgrims to travel together to Canterbury and to tell stories on the way. And he gets them to agree that he, Harry Bailey, will decide who has told the best story. That pilgrim will be treated to dinner at the cost of all the other pilgrims. Of course, Harry Bailey ensures that his decision, his decision will be honored by having everyone pledge that anyone who disagrees with his judgment will pay for dinner for everybody. <laughs> so, by the way, is it just coincidence that the brother of the protagonist of Capra's It's a Wonderful World is named Harry Bailey? <laughs> that Chaucer, you know, he has a lot of influence. Okay, so back to the original Harry Bailey. Whatever may have been Chaucer's final decision about the, the, the collection of stories, he manages to finish not even the least ambitious of these plans, which have each pilgrim telling one story. Now, if we count the host, there are 30 pilgrims on this pilgrimage. The column on the left uh, consists of all the pilgrims whom Chaucer introduces by trade and then provides brief backstories for us so we know who they are as individuals. Uh, not completely consistently though, because if you'll see there are some asterisks next to the Knights Yeoman and the cook, narrator and the host, because the Knights Yeoman is mentioned and is introduced, we get some information, about, but he never tells a story. The cook is introduced, starts a story, but it breaks off shortly after it has begun, so it's not finished. The narrator, we know nothing about. He tells us nothing about himself. But he tells two stories. Well, one and a half, because the host stops him halfway through the first one and says, this is so bad, it hurts my ears. <laughs> You've got to stop. So then the narrator tells another story. Anyway, and then there's a host who is not introduced so much. I mean, we know who he is, but we don't know anything about him. But we hear a lot from him in the course of the pilgrimage. At the top right, we have five, seven more pilgrims. The second nun and the nun's priest are both mentioned in the prologue, not introduced in any detail, but they do both tell stories. The five guildsmen, guildsmen are the, the guilds are the forerunners of today's unions. The five guildsmen on the pilgrimage are mentioned by trade, no introduction, and they don't tell stories either. Then at the bottom right, we have two pilgrims who join the pilgrimage late on the way. A canon, who is a priest assigned to take care of a major church. A canon and the canon's yeoman, yeoman is, is a generic term for a uh, servant. Uh, they join the pilgrimage. The canon rides off immediately. He's apparently pursued by someone. But the canon's yeoman tells a story. So you can see that nearly a quarter of the pilgrims do not tell stories in any of the nearly 100 fragments of manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales that we have. Nor do we have an ending for the work as a whole. There's no description of the arrival at Canterbury. There's no identification of who won the storytelling concept. It's just, it's not there. Well, I decided that I should fix all that. <laughs> and if you are thinking how presumptuous, 
How dare I try to finish what is commonly recognized as one of the great literary works to come out of the English-speaking literary world? You're right. <laughs> but here's the thing. I'm actually doing something very medieval. In the Middle Ages, unfinished works were regularly finished by someone else 10, 50, 100 years later. There's the unfinished story of Tristan is sold, which is finished by several other people sometime later. There is the uh, Trojan War story told by many, many people in the Middle Ages and finished in lots of different versions by many people. And there's the, the Roman de la Rose, which is a seminal work for really everything Chaucer does and a seminal work for the whole theory of courtly love and practice of courtly love. And that's begun by one poet to the tune of about 4,000 lines and finished by another one with another 18,000 lines. He didn't think that he, the first author got even close enough. <laughs> so add to that to the fact that in the Middle Ages, the more often a story was retold, and this I think connects with some of the points that Jessica was making, uh, the more it gains in stature and importance. Originality, as we tend to think of it, is not valued. Chaucer himself created none of the stories he tells. He and Shakespeare, still in the same tradition for that matter, made up nothing that they told. They borrowed from everybody else, and everybody thought that was fine. So this book is solidly in the center of the medieval tradition, <laughs> even though it may not feel like it. Uh, now, in completing this work, I've done six things. The first thing, of course, was obviously that I translated more than 300 pages of mostly poetry into what I hope is engaging and readable modern English prose. I also created backstories, there we go, uh, for the various pilgrims who are just mentioned by trade. So you, now we have some information about what makes each of them interesting or individual. I then found and assigned appropriate medieval stories for those characters who tell, who didn't tell stories to begin with, but whom I have telling stories, and I finished the cook's tale. And then I provided an ending in, in the host's judgment, who told the best story. I've also enhanced the extant exchanges among the pilgrims between stories. They have at each other quite a bit. I've enhanced all that for two purposes. One, to let modern audiences have a sense of how the pilgrims themselves heard the stories, what they were hearing, their reactions, why they were having the reactions they were having. And two, because I wanted to provide context for the assumptions that Chaucer would have made about his audience, not what they knew or should have known that modern audiences might not know. And then finally, I've included all of the tales that Chaucer tells in his original. In the last half century or so, there have been a number of modern versions of the Canterbury Tales translated and published for general audiences, like this book. But not one of them includes two of the stories that are clearly part of Chaucer's original plan. One of them is the second story that the narrator tells. It's called The Tale of Meliabus. It's a parable about the virtue of prudence. The second story is the Parson's Tale, which is very important because it's clearly the last tale. Even without the ending, we know that from where it's positioned and the kind of story it is. And it's a, a sermon on the seven deadly sins. These two tales are simply ignored by every other contemporary reteller of the Canterbury Tales, and I understand why. They are seemingly endless, they are deadly boring, and they consist of page after page after page of biblical and philosophical references, or painfully articulated details of every venial and mortal sin human beings can commit or even imagine. <laughs> now since this is the only complete version of the Canterbury Tales, I obviously had to include them certain that no one would actually read them. I kept them, but I shortened them significantly. 
I kept the gist. I tried to eliminate material that I don't believe any modern audiences would, would be willing to plow through. And I also tried to make them a little more digestible by allowing various pilgrims to express their impatience as the stories unfold. Happily, you will have to deal with only a portion of what they had to put up with. In selecting the stories I added, I had to make a major decision. Whether the new tales would develop further, maintain the, th the major themes that Chaucer has in the Canterbury Tales, or whether I would have the new tales go in some other direction and develop an, an, a different theme. There is a school of thought that the whole Canterbury Tales is really Chaucer's effort simply to talk about the seven deadly sins. And believe me, they are all represented in the Canterbury Tales. And so I understand that point of thought. I don't think that's what the Canterbury Tales are really about. I do, I, most critics, and I agree, however, that there are three major themes in Chaucer's work. The first one is order. I'm sorry, sorry power. Uh, Chaucer asks, what is power? Who wields it? How does that change, shape, control our lives depending on who's in charge? The second major theme is about relationships. Jessica touched on that. In these tales, Chaucer explores love, marriage, friendship, parenting, the transactional relationships that make possible barter and commerce, the interactions of people who come from very different social levels, the complexity of human interaction, the relationship of human to divine, and all of it from multiple and varying points of view, each held by one of the pilgrims who have very different points of view about just about everything. Chaucer never tells us what to believe who is right, how to figure out what's true. He simply allows people to tell their stories. The third theme is order. Chaucer asks us to consider whether we think we live in an ordered reality or whether life is simply unorganized chaos. Is there a divine plan? Is there a plan of any kind? Is life predictable, orderly, and trustworthy? Or is everything up for grabs, messy, purposeless? I ultimately decided that I would have the new stories that I added be informed by a fourth concept, one that is clearly of great interest to Chaucer in everything he writes about, Chaucer, the Canterbury Tales, and all of his other works. And that is the question or the issue of transformation. The one constant in human experience is change. Chaucer not only writes about it, but seems constantly to explore how transformation works and what its effects are. How it impacts and shapes our experience. How we can, how we do, and how we must deal with it. So, with all of that as context, let me read you a couple of things from the book to illustrate Chaucer's original work and also what I have done in adding to it. To begin with, this is how Chaucer, it's, Jessica and I didn't discuss this, but it's interesting that she should pick on the wife of Beth, because that's what I'm going to do as well. So this is Chaucer's introduction of the wife of Beth. There was a, was a woman from Bath, a goodly wife, who unfortunately was a bit hard of hearing. She was such a skilled cloth maker that she easily surpassed those from Ypres and Gaunt. In her entire parish, no woman was allowed to precede her when it was time to take the offering to the altar. But if such an unfortunate event occurred, her anger knew no bounds. Her head coverings were so finely woven that I dare say her head was weighed down by 10 pounds of a Sunday. Her tightly laced stockings gleamed with the finest scarlet and her shoes were made of supple leather, of course, in the latest fashion. She had a proud look on her fair, ruddy face, but was somewhat gap-toothed, if I am to be honest with you. She had always been a respectable woman, and, not counting other companions in her youth, 
she had been betrothed at church door to five husbands. But there's no reason to dwell on that now. She rode her horse comfortably and was well-versed in travel on and off the beaten path. Three pilgrimages to Jerusalem, not to mention crossings many a foreign sea on her travels to Rome and Bologna and Cologne and the shrine of St. James of Compostela. Her large wimple was covered by an even larger hat, as broad as a buckler or a shield. She wore a rich overskirt around her wide hips and made no effort to hide the spurs on her feet. She could tell a joke and knew how to have a good time. There is no doubt but that she knew all the tricks of the trade in love, and she was well versed in remedies for lovesickness. The story that Chaucer has the wife tell is an Arthurian romance. It's the only time in all of Chaucer's work that he dabbles in what is clearly the most popular narrative form of the Middle Ages. So this is a portion of the wife's tale. In King Arthur's, court, King Arthur's court, there was a fine, very good looking young knight who happened to be riding along the river and saw before him a young woman walking along all alone. And so he stopped. And despite her unwillingness, he took, by force, her maiden head. The news of this wrong was greeted with such an uproar that Arthur, King Arthur, as was the law, condemned the young knight to death, and he would have lost his head. But the queen and many other ladies entreated the king so persistently that he granted the knight's life to the queen leaving the handsome young man's fate entirely in her hands. The queen said to the knight in open court, I will grant you life if you can tell me one thing. What is it that women most want? You thought Freud invented that, right? Yeah. No. You must answer this question correctly if you want to keep your neck from the executioner's axe. Of course, I don't expect you to know what to say right now, so I will give you 12 months and a day to seek out and discover the right response to this question. But you must pledge to yield your body at this place a year from now. The knight had no choice, and so he agreed. Wherever he went, he asked the answer to this question in every house and every place, but never found even two people with the same answer. Some told him that women loved wealth above all. Some said honor, some said fun, some claimed it was beautiful dresses, some said great lust in bed, and some said to be married and widowed multiple times. Some told him that our women's hearts are most at ease when we are flattered and pampered. This, I will admit, comes closer to the truth because certainly flattery will win our hearts and attention and care will trap us, some more, some less. Some told him that women want above all to be free and do whatever we want, with no man chiding us for our flaws, but always complimenting us and never holding us to be foolish. Still others said that we want to be considered constant and discreet, never to betray what men tell us secretly. But that opinion is not worth a rake's handle. God knows we women can't keep a secret to save our souls. Remember Midas? Let me tell you that story. Along with lots of other stories, Ovid tells us that Midas had two ass's ears growing out of his head, something he managed to keep from everyone around except his wife. Now, he loved her more than anyone, and he trusted her with his secret. Of course, he begged her not to tell anyone of his disfigurement, and she swore that even if she were offered the whole world, she would not risk her husband's dishonor and shame as well as her own. But then she got to a point where she thought that she would die if she couldn't tell someone. So she ran down to a marsh, placed her mouth right next to the water and whispered, do not betray me, water, as I tell this to you and no one else. My husband has two asses ears, and that made her feel better. But all this proves is that we women can't keep a secret. 
maybe for a time, but it must eventually come out. We simply can't do it. But if you want to know how this story ends, you'll have to read Ovid. The knight, who my story is primarily about, saw that he was coming no closer to achieving his goal, and his breast was filled with despair. It was time to turn his steed toward home. But then he came across four and twenty ladies joined in dance. And he drew near them, hoping to learn something useful. But as he came closer, they vanished without a trace, leaving one old woman sitting there on the green. A woman so foul that words cannot do justice to her horrible appearance. She rose as the knight approached, and she said to him, Sir Knight, here you will find no path to further your journey. By your faith, though, tell me what you seek, and I will maybe help you. Old folks like me know a lot of things. My dear ancient mother, he replied, I am dead unless I can learn what it is that women most want. If you can tell me that, I will reward you most handsomely. Give me your word, she answered, that you shall do whatever I ask of you, and I shall tell you the very thing you seek. Here's my word, said the knight, I so consent. In that case, she said, I assure you that your life is safe because the queen will say the same thing as I will tell you. I don't care if she is the proudest of women. Whether she wears a kerchief or a crown on her head, she will not gainsay what I shall teach you. Let us go together back to the court without further ado. She then whispered something in his ear and bade him be glad and of good cheer. So in keeping with the wife's approach, I guess you'll have to read my book to find out what she told him. <laughs> <clears throat> so I want to read two excerpts now from what I have added to the book to show you what I've done. As I said, Chaucer mentions five guildsmen, and he does not describe them, nor does he get around to having to tell them stories. So here is my introduction of the guildsmen and specifically of the carpenter. We had with us an entire group dressed in the matching livery of a, dig of a dignified and respected parish guild, a carpenter, a weaver, a dyer, a tapestry maker, and a seller of hats and small clothing items, a haberdasher. Their outfits were new, shiny, and recently embellished. Their knives were inlaid not with brass, but with silver, worked neatly and precisely, as were their belts and purses. I'm sure they all looked quite splendid when they were seated on the dais of the guild hall, each of them considered wise enough and possessed of sufficient property and income to serve as a suitable town official. The carpenter appeared to be their somewhat unlike leader, as the four others had much more in common in terms of their trades. His name was Joseph, and he liked to talk about Jesus and Joseph being carpenters. His wife's name was Mary, and I fear that he believed each word he spoke to be about his own holy family. He had no sons, but six daughters, and their names were inscribed on the wooden cross that hung from a gold chain around his neck. Joseph was tall and thin, and he expected his companions to treat him as he thought the biblical Joseph should have been treated. He imagined himself a carver and made good use of his sharp knife to create small cribs that held a baby Jesus but he expected endless thanks for each one he bestowed on some fortunate individual. His speech was drawn through his nose, and he looked down that same nose at all who crossed his path. So that's Joseph the carpenter. Here's an excerpt from the tale that I have him tell. I am a carpenter by trade and proud of it, for without craftsmen like me, especially carpenters, much of the world's story would be very different. Our, own, our very own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was a carpenter and the son of a carpenter. Now, I think you will agree that the craft I practice has a long and glorious history and is much blessed by God, 
and acknowledged in the good book and in stories that have been handed down to us over many generations and from many countries in the world. After all, none of us would be here today were it not for that great and holy carpenter, Noah, who was instructed by God himself to how to build the ark that saved all mankind when the Lord was angry enough with sinful men to flood all he had created. God spoke to Noah and told him just how to construct the ark that saved the beasts of the field and Noah's family. And who could forget the Greek Epeus, skilled artisan that he was, who built a mighty wooden horse that was used by the Greeks to overcome the great city of Troy by stealth and cunning that allowed them to hide their soldiers in the belly of the horse, to burn, pillage, and destroy that great city once they had entered through the city gates in their wooden structure. Today I want to tell you a story about a great craftsman and carpenter who lived in ancient times and was known as Daedalus. I'm no scholar, but I have been told that his name meant someone who works cunningly. And certainly he was able to build anything people desired and some things they could not even imagine. He created, created statues from any material available, made so well that people thought they were alive. There is a story that tells of the great hero Hercules, mightiest of men, who saw a statue of himself that Daedalus had crafted. And the statue was in a threatening stance. Hercules reacted as if he were really being attacked by it and smashed it with his club. Daedalus was able to make such pieces because he knew how to make the body look as if it moved freely, as human bodies do. He also made faces with realistic features like eyes. Oh, microphone fell down? Okay. Like eyes uh, with all the parts human eyes have. Daedalus is often called an architect and a sculptor, but we must never forget that at the heart of all he did was carpentry. After he was banished from Athens for killing his own nephew, he was welcomed in Crete by King Minos, who put, De who put Daedalus in charge of the upkeep and maintenance of everything in his palace. Now, it's important to know that Minos had asked for the aid of the Greek god of the oceans, Poseidon, to help him conquer Crete. Poseidon did. He aided him, sending Minos a beautiful white bull as a sign of his favor, but expecting Minos to sacrifice the bull to him. But Minos liked the bull too much to do so. Poseidon became very angry at this, and he punished Minos by putting a spell on his wife, Pasiphae, so that she would fall in love with this very bull. Although it seems unlikely to us, Pasiphae fell so completely for the white bull that she spent day and night trying to find a way to mate with him. What matters to my story, of course, is that Pasiphae was able to act on her passion with the bull only because of the skills of Daedalus, whom I have not forgotten in all this, for he is the center of my tale. Pasiphae knew how skilled Daedalus was in all things, so she asked him to build something that would allow her to satisfy her lust for this animal. Well, you can imagine, even for Greeks, such a thing was outrageous. But after he had collected himself and seen that she was indeed serious, Daedalus used his considerable imagination and even greater skills to construct a cow from wood wrapped with cowhide. The wooden cow was hollow, so Pasiphae could climb into it to have her way with the bull, to whom this creature would have appeared to be just another cow with which to mate. The long and short of it is that the bull impregnated Pasiphae, and the issue of this unnatural union was a male child who was named Asterion, who would become known throughout history as the Minotaur, part man, part bull. As the Minotaur grew into adulthood, he became increasingly moody and dangerous, and it was necessary to restrain him. Once again, Daedalus was called upon to solve the problem. So he built an enormous, elaborate maze underneath the palace, and here the Minotaur reigns supreme. Daedalus had several children, of whom Icarus was the best known. A time came when King Minos had decided that his lifelong friend and ally Daedalus had become his enemy. It was then that Minos confined him and his son Icarus in the very labyrinth that Daedalus had built. 
Now Daedalus knew that his maze was far too intricate even for him to escape in any way that one normally might try to gain freedom. But he determined that the only way out was by air. So then Joseph tells the story of Icarus and how he dies, misusing the wings his father built for him, emphasizing, of course, all the while, the skills of Daedalus in carpentry. OK, so you've heard some of Chaucer's, some of mine. With that, I thank you for listening. And uh, I think Jesse is going to MC questions you may have that she will answer. <laughs> thank you. back in College Hall <laughs> as a student <coughs> this time. Um, I will bring the microphone around for anyone who has a question. Yes. Ah, brave soul. Uh, this, this writing, it's been 50 years since I've read any of it, and I never understood it when I first did it. So, um, well, I hope that'll change. <laughs> Yes, it will. But at any rate, uh, in his writings, the, the church was preeminent then, I assume, in the 1300s. So in, was, in almost every aspect of life, especially aspect. education. Okay. So this influenced the, all of the Canterbury Tales. Right. It was, but it was more than a catechism. The assumption is properly so, that everybody is what we now think of as Catholic. Everybody is steeped in that. There really is only one worldview, and of course, if you differ from that, you are a heretic, and you are probably killed for it. So uh, everybody shares a whole lot of ethos and of story and of imagination and of explanation of how the world is supposed to work. Uh, Jessica, I think, hinted at this. One of the things that the wife of Bath does is simply by talking the way she talks about her experience, and, and more than that, even then by telling the story, she shows very clearly that point of view is everything, and that you have to be able to try to think from the other person's perspective as well as from your own if you are really going to be honest about things. And she, she takes the church on quite directly gets away with it because nobody takes her seriously. Because if they took her seriously, she'd be dead. <laughs> but she actually challenges, uh, well, basically she challenges everything the church is teaching about sex. Because the church's teaching on sex is that anytime passion is involved in a relationship, including marriage, it's a moral sin. And the wife of Bath says, I beg to differ. I don't think God gave us these parts of our body just to go to the bathroom. <laughs> that's, what, that's what she does. I mean, she's very clear about that. And, and she's poo-pooed by the monk, for example, by the, the clerics, because this is just a silly old woman talking. You know, pay no attention to her. Because if they took her seriously, she would not be able to get away with that. So his rebellion was in his writing. The envelope that he lived within, he probably understood. And he was looking for ways to create little cracks. Chaucer did the same thing that he has the wife of Bath do, which is that he attacks with humor. Yeah. He, he doesn't let people take him too seriously. He cloaks it in, in irony and in joking. Uh, he creates these narrators who are pretty dumb who tell really smart stories. Um, but he gets away with it because he doesn't take them on directly. Well, I'm, I'm not going to say anything more. But, uh, it's just interesting because it, 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 it gives you a perspective of a portrayal of the world that they were in. And yet, at the same time, the themes that include it. I think that's what all great writers do, right? Is they are able to depict the human experience in ways that we recognize, 
but that challenges us at the same time to think about it differently. Chaucer is very good at that. <clears throat> so time travel uh, narratives in novels and TV shows are really hot right now. <laughs> so if Chaucer were to travel here, can you tell me two things that might shock him and two things he would say, oh yeah, I could have predicted that in 2022. <laughs> That's a good idea. I doubt that he would be shocked by anything. I, I, do, I, I mean that. I mean... Chaucer really has an amazing ability to be of his time and to transcend it at the same time. Uh, you know, you've heard the often quoted thing about there's nothing human that I cannot identify with. I'm not quite sure he'd be there, but, but I, I'd be surprised if there was anything that, that we, he would find shocking. What was the second part was what the well, two things? Well, I think you have to understand that at the heart of what I think Chaucer is trying to do in all of his literature is that he's trying to figure out how poetry, how art really works. How is it that some people can take the words everybody has access to and make something happen that is greater than the sum of its parts, create this magic? I think that's the question he's exploring in everything he is writing about. In fact, I suspect that is one of the reasons he doesn't finish a whole lot of what he's doing because I think by his own standards of excellence, he hasn't achieved it, he hasn't figured it out, and he's pretty sure that he's failed. That's, that's my guess. So in that sense, I think he would say, well, of course you still haven't figured it out. We still, you still don't really know how art works, how poetry works, what it is, what is art, what isn't. And that's the same question that he tried to deal with on his own. By the way, the, one of the stories that I used to think, originally thought of was a throwaway, was the Canon's Yeoman's Tale. Because the Canon's Yeoman is the one who rides up in the middle of the pilgrimage, tells a story, and it's not a very well-told story. The canon's yeoman tells a story about alchemy, about his canon, who isn't really his canon. He keeps saying, it's not, I'm not talking about my canon, but I know this canon, and his canon is being pursued by somebody for some reason. I know this canon who keeps doing alchemy, and he keeps failing at it. It never gets there, but boy, I'm hooked. I can't leave it alone. For me, that's the essence of Chaucer's whole th thinking about art. Art is a kind of alchemy. It is a kind of magic that creates illusions that we know are illusions but love anyway. We like to be fooled. And Chaucer is exploring that, I think, in that, in that story, uh, which is continued by people like Thomas Mann uh, in his novels about uh, the con man who is really an artist who produces such great cons that people love being conned by him. Okay. So I think, I think that's what he would recognize as a problem we still haven't solved, that he didn't solve, that I don't think he expects anybody ultimately to solve. I didn't have two of them. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Go to college. Like, how, how did it happen? What, what, what was it that graduated? So I had an undergraduate course in Chaucer. And God bless Gonzaga, but it was awful. <laughs> it was... My teacher thought that we should not actually read Chaucer, but that we should read C.S. Lewis talking about Chaucer. We never got the Chaucer. It was awful. I, just, I was just, OK, that's it. We're done. Then I got to graduate school. And I went to graduate school with the idea, you know, they, you're asked as a graduate student, what is it that you want to pursue? What are you interested in? Well, for me, the issue was, why do some stories survive that keep being retold and retold and retold? And every generation has some version of it, and can, they continue to happen. 
So that was what I was interested in. That obviously took me to medieval to start with. And I took a couple of Chaucer courses that were really quite wonderful. And that got me hooked. And I, even though I had a, one disastrous experience with Chaucer because we were doing a seminar on the Canterbury Tales and I was assigned the Franklin's Tale. And the Franklin's Tale historically in terms of literary criticism has been, was seen as the story in which Chaucer finally solves the problem of how to bring romance, courtly love, which is based on adultery, in harmony, into harmony with marriage, supposedly based on love, okay? Although marriage in the Middle Ages was a political economic union much more than it was ever one of the heart. So I researched this poem and, and I, it, I kept being struck by the fact that this is, doesn't work. It's just that there are too many holes in this story. There's not, he doesn't resolve anything. So I wrote a paper which basically argued that that poem was anything but the resolution of courtly love and, and, and marriage, but that it was actually showed the, the discrepancies between them and the fact that they really can't be brought together. And my professor, I got the paper back and he had written on it, um, nice try, but you're dead wrong. <laughs> B plus. Six months later, a major article by a major Saucerian scholar hits the road, hits, hits the world, and it says exactly what I had said. Okay, well, ironically, that got me hooked because I figured, oh, okay, I guess what I'm doing here could work after all, right? And, and you have to, I mean, I, I come out of the new criticism, which then was the new criticism when I was in graduate school, which has been superseded by lots of other popular forms by now. But the criticism, historically, Chaucer and criticism was about what we knew about Chaucer. We knew, happened to know a lot about him because he worked for the government and everything he did was documented. So we know what he got paid for, when he didn't get paid, what he was supposed to do. And because of that, historically, Chaucer and criticism was all about uh, why did Chaucer do this? Well, it's because he had this job at the time. That was it. The new criticism came along and said, no, no, no. If this is literature, it's got to speak to us. You can't, you can't make sense of Chaucer only because you are a medieval person. If, if this is art, it transcends his time. So the text itself is worth looking at and analyzing. And that was very exciting for, for me. And that's what got me hooked. And then, of course, the opportunity to teach Chaucer for nearly four, four decades was wonderful because Chaucer, like Shakespeare, like a very few other authors, is somebody that is new every time you read it again. You, something else you discovered that you didn't see before. And that's kept me interested. Hi, um, do you feel like you left any uh, kind of business untended to, like in a couple of years you're gonna come out with a more complete version? <laughs> I hope so. I think that would be entirely appropriate because, I mean, mine, this is my take uh, based on what I know about Chaucer and about literature and about the Middle Ages, et cetera. And it, I would certainly not try to argue that it is the final word. So, yeah. I won't be doing that, but somebody might. <laughs> She's bringing you a microphone. Um, Mike, this is Linda Carroll. We've Hi, Linda. Goes back to Linda and I were faculty members, yeah, very young faculty members well, at and, DU in the 70s. And before that, we were students in the 60s, and you were the assistant in the language laboratory when I was taking Italian. <laughs> so let me bring this full circle by asking, um, how did Chaucer, as a literary man, see his, his work and what he was doing in relationship to Boccaccio? I'm sorry, the last part of what you said? In relationship to Boccaccio, to Boccaccio's decamera. Oh, oh, yeah. He, <laughs> it's, it's just fascinating because Chaucer is very medieval in that particular context. 
Uh, lots of poets in the Middle Ages who stole liberally from other people uh, did so denying their sources. And Chaucer certainly does that with Boccaccio. Uh, Troilus and Crusade is clearly Boccaccio's because some of it is word for word translation. I mean, you, you can't argue it isn't. Chaucer never gives Boccaccio the time of day. He never mentions him. He never admits that he had anything to do with him. He gives Dante credit. He gives Petrarch credit, not Boccaccio. It's fascinating because I think without Boccaccio, Chaucer wouldn't have become Chaucer. Boccaccio had a whole lot. To teach. I mean, the, the Decameron is basically an earlier version of the Canterbury Tales with uh, some significant new wrinkles because the Decameron is pretty stationary. There's not much interaction. There's, the frame really is pretty stable and st st static. And Chaucer, of course, develops that frame enormously by introducing each of the pilgrims with, or some of the pilgrims with all those details, et cetera. But he, so I, I guess I've got to say that in terms of Boccaccio, I, there's some kind of love-hate relationship that, that I don't understand. In terms of the rest of his uh, era, when you consider uh, who else is writing, producing literature in England or in, in French too, as well at the time. Um, Chaucer had to feel like he was all out there by himself. I'd, he was doing things that no, none of his peers were doing. You know, Gower, who is probably the second most famous lit English writer of, of that era, uh, is, he's writing things that just aren't even close to what I think Chaucer is doing. And Chaucer, by the way, is doing something very bold. Chaucer, Gower writes books in which a third is in French, a third is in Latin, and a third is in English, because he's trying to hedge his bets. Because it's, it's up for grabs as to what's going to win out. And he's trying to meet everybody. And Chaucer basically says, no, nope, it's English. I'm going with English. I also think that he, his experiments with prose are part of what he anticipated as the coming art form, as something that was going to become much more popular than what he was doing, than what people were doing in poetry. So that's my best guess. In my, in my novel, I, I have a, a pretty negative relationship between Chaucer and Gower, and Chaucer talks about Gower as somebody who makes poetry the way butchers make sausage. Thank you, everybody, for being here to celebrate Dr. Herzog. And thank you, Dr. Mike Herzog. Thank I think you, we're ready. Jessica. <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you. I hope you enjoy the book.